I can hear you. Okay, great. So, um, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for this coffee chat with Women in Vecna Robotics. I am Sanjuksha Nikude. I'm here with my co-organizer Dharini for Women in Robotics Boston. Dharini would also be our moderator with Vecna Robotics tonight. So um, a little bit about uh, who we are. We are um, the Boston chapter of Women in Robotics Global Community, founded by Andra K at Silicon Valley Robotics in California. Our aim is to inspire and enable more women to enter and grow in the field of robotics. And this is our very first collaboration event with Vecna Robotics. We are very happy to welcome all our panelists here from Vecna Robotics. We have these amazing women working in the field and we have an opportunity to ask and talk, uh, ask questions and talk with them. So just a little side note, anyone from any professional background who supports our cause in encouraging women in the robotics field are welcome to join, join the group. You can find us on meetingplace.com. Um, I'll share, I'll keep sharing the link in the group chat. So please feel free to join us and Without wasting any more further time, I would like to hand over to Dharini to introduce us to these amazing women. Uh, thank you, Sanjuksha. Uh, today we are partners with Vecna Robotics to dive deeper into the lives of these industrious women working in robotics. And I'm really honored to introduce our panelists. Uh, first is Kay Perkinson. Kay is the Chief of Staff and Interim VP of Advanced Development. She is responsible for organizing and aligning strategic priorities with members of the senior leadership team, designing and facilitating the cross-company processes and communication, and supporting the CEO on strategic initiatives. She has held a variety of non-technical roles across industries, including solar technology, healthcare, and finance. She holds a BA in Environmental Sciences from Northwestern University, where she played center midfield on Division I Varsity Women's Soccer Team. Kay lives with her husband currently, Jim, and an engineering manager at Boeing, and four children, Ashton, Logan, Evan, and Benjamin, at their family home in Winchester. Hi, Kay. <laughs> Thank you for joining Hi. us tonight. Hello, everyone. Really happy to be here. Uh, next is Deandra Rago. Uh, hi, Deandra. Uh, Deandra is the Director of Human Resources. Uh, she's responsible for implementing and executing internal programs, policies, and is initiatives around employee engagement and performance, diversity and inclusion, corporate training, and immigration. She's an SHRM Senior Certified Professional and has completed Veterans at Work and Employing Abilities at Work Certificates. Deandra previously served as a Director of Talent Acquisition for both Vecna Robotics and its healthcare IT predecessor, Vecna Technologies, and started her career as a project manager. She graduated from MIT Sloan School of Management with a BS in Management Science and spent three years in combined computer science and mechanical engineering programs. As an undergraduate, she served as both president of MIT Society of Women Engineers as a career fair director, where she first met Vecna. Deandra currently lives in Bereka with her husband, Bruno, and daughters, Annalise and Carolina. Thank you. Deandra for joining us tonight. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next is Zoe, uh, Zoe Snipe. She is the product architect for Enterprise Software Team, which is supporting client integrations work and working on scaling up our products and platform. Uh, Zoe start, started out working on the first release of Fecna Robotics web-based tool used to monitor and, and administer robots. From there, she was involved in robotics projects like NextGen VGO, OmniEye, QC Arm, Armbot, and much more. She grew up in Tacoma, Washington, and got her bachelor's in EECS, -E uh, 6 3 for the MIT crowd uh, today in uh, 2015. Currently, she is in Seattle, working from home for three years, uh, with a partner who is currently getting his PhD in astronomy from University of Washington. In her free time, she loves to bake and go for long walks. Uh, work out while watching cartoons and tend her pea plants and tomatoes in the balcony. Hi Zoe, thanks for being with here uh, uh, with us tonight. Uh, next is Janani, Janani Mohan. Uh, she's a, ro a robotic software engineer. Uh, she has a master's degree in robotics engineering specialized in swarm robotics from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. She was previously employed as an embedded systems engineer at Bosch 
the world of machines and automation has always inspired her and she enjoys making fun hobby projects. The first robot that she made was a human following robot called Vodapot, which is like a faithful pet, but also helps transport items from different rooms aimed to help elderly carry items within their household. She envisions a future in robotics with her contribution to inventing technologies which make life easier. Apart from robotics, she's passionate about learning new skills and spend her free time with her plants. Thank you, Janani, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. I would just like you, you all to introduce the format of our panel discussion. Uh, we have picked the questions from the survey you, you all filled on Eventbrite, which our panelists will take turns answering. Any additional questions from the live audience can be asked in the events Q&A section. They would be taken in the end if there's any time left. So keep upvoting the questions. We can select the questions depending on your likes and upvotes. Um, you can, there's a chat section for you as well. Uh, you can ping any of our panelists, any, any of the fellow attendees and just get started talking. Uh, without further, de further delay, let's get started. Uh, our first question. A, a first question to our panelist is, how did you get join, um, sorry, how did you get in the field of robotics and what it is like to work at a robotics technology startup? Over to you guys. Deandra, you have some thought, thoughts on that? I do, I will start on that one. So um, when I was an undergraduate at MIT, I actually started out as a mechanical engineer and flip flop back and forth between mechanical engineering and computer science for about three years. Um, during my time uh, in those fields, I spent two summers doing an undergraduate research opportunity with the Agile Robotics Group. I learned a lot of cool things, learned SolidWorks, uh, or at least a small aspect of SolidWorks. Um, and by the time I got to my senior year, I realized that I really liked being in technology, but that I didn't actually want to be an engineer. So I pivoted my, my academic career into a management track, and then I actually started at FECNA as a project manager. So I knew that I wanted to be in technology, just not in an engineering capacity. Um, but I, I'm the most technical HR person you'll probably run across. Uh, I think I can share some thoughts on that. Um, so I started my uh, career like in robotics in my during my undergrad days uh, back in India. Um, so it was like uh, we, we didn't have like big space for uh, trying out robots for small club we started in our college and we just wanted to start with very basics of developing a machine uh, which can move around and detect stuff. So it, it, the most uh, interesting thing for me was like to develop something on my own, like every single part, including the mechanical design, the electronics part, as well as like the entire code of that robot was like controlled by us. That's like, so, so super cool. And that's what actually got me into robotics because you can develop something on your own and then people can use it and get like immense satisfaction out of it. So that's kind of my entry into robotics and uh, Tecna specifically is after I completed my master's in Actually, during my, during my master's at WPI, I was an intern at Pekna and I worked on a like, super cool project, which was completely based on computer vision on a real robot. So that was like, uh, it was amazing because I could actually develop the whole feature of it. And the end result was like a, a complete world mapped out by a robot with a moving arm. So I really enjoyed that project. And uh, that kind of drove me into Vecna Robotics. Uh, the best part for me is like the people here and I enjoy working with everybody here and the opportunities given to you as a person is like immense. Uh, you can kind of give you a kind of a ownership of what you do and then you can actually see the result as and when you do something at Vecna Robotics. So it's been pretty cool so far. That's a great story. Uh, Zoe, you, you want to add, add something to that? Um, yeah, sure. So I actually didn't do like anything related to robotics at all during my undergrad. Um, I just did computer science stuff. And so I started at Vecna just doing web development. Um, so like Drini said, I worked on some of the early web tools for like supporting the robots. Um, and then I was working here over a few years, you know, I kind of branched out and tried a few different things more related to like the code that runs on the robots and some of our research projects. Um, so I, I really like working here. Um, I think the fun thing about working at a robotics technology startup is that um, everybody kind of has to be involved in every piece of it. Um, so you're always being exposed to new technologies, trying new things, um, wearing a lot of hats. Um, I think that's very fun and dynamic. 
Um, and then you do get to see something actually running on the ground, like in our customers' warehouses. That's pretty rewarding. Yeah, so I have a slightly different story. Um, so I am non-technical through and through, uh, unlike a lot of these women here tonight. Um, but I actually, uh, you know, as Serene had mentioned in the intros, I've bounced around quite a bit in my career, but all focused within the project management business process optimization space. Um, and I've really, you know, utilized that core skill set to transition into a variety of different industries. Um, you know, so as Serene mentioned, I um, have worked in solar tech, finance, healthcare and I think just in general technology is really um, what's inspired me most in my career um, it's really fun to be around incredibly smart intelligent hardworking and driven individuals who want to build something um, and it's really different being a part of an organization where there's a tangible product uh, and when the opportunity to join Vecna Robotics came up I, I absolutely jumped on it um, and I've been here for about six months and, and really excited to see where the company's going Thank you, Kay, even we, we are excited a lot too. Um, thank you all for your insights on this. Uh, let's move on to the second question. Uh, what does your day-to-day -day in the office look like? Any productivity tricks or favorite apps you use to stay on the top of the game? Zoe, maybe you have something? Yeah, sure. So I wanted to, to talk about this because I have been working remotely from my house um, for almost three years now. Um, so you can kind of see if you look around, I have a pretty set up home office. Um, I know everybody's working from home right now. Um, but one thing that I've really found helpful is to be really intentional about setting up a space. You know, so I have my little thing here with my wall divider and my curtain and my whiteboard. Um, and you can't see them, but I have two monitors and a standing desk and everything. Um, and so having that like physical workspace in my house, um, I think has been the most important thing that I've done working from home. Um, and then the other one is having like a bit of a daily routine. Um, and so we have our standups at 11 a.m. Eastern, which is 8 a.m. for me. Um, so that's kind of the first thing I do in the morning is I get up, you know, I go for a little walk and make my tea. Um, I go to stand up um, and then I like sit down and do my to-do list. And then I have kind of a framework for what I want to get done the rest of the day. Um, so that's about it. I never realized uh, setting up your desk, how, how much that is important until now. Oh, yeah, definitely. Chinani, uh, maybe you want to share something? Uh, yeah, I can talk in both terms, like before, like starting this work from home practice right now and like what we wear after that. So um, usually the day starts with like going to work and then we have like a small warehouse space next to where I sit. So somebody comes running from there saying, okay, something is not working. Some robot is not moving. So some issue. So mostly the day starts with that, trying to figure out what's going on and what's going wrong and some improvements on that end. But uh, otherwise, pretty much it's mostly like a focused time in the morning for doing a bit of code reviews. And then we have a stand up where we discuss what we did like throughout the day. And then we start actually getting jumping into the work and start doing developing new features and stuff. So it's been uh, pretty agile and pretty cool. And uh, we have our own like fun times with client deployments, which come and go. And uh, we have a fair share of problems to solve that too. Uh, but working from home has been like a good transition. Like initially it was like difficult to cope up and we used to ask Zoe for tips because she has been like <laughs> the person who has been doing it for a long time. And uh, but I think gradually we all got used to like uh, setting up a space where we are focused and we get the, our attention fully on our work and as well as have the rest of the space or rest of the day allotted for doing something different in our life apart from work. Uh, but the transition has been like, it, it took its own time and it had, it had its uh, benefits and issues too. Uh, productivity apps, um, I would say that it's, so the one of the key things which I, at least like uh, at Vecna is that we use Teams and it does help me kind of manage uh, or like schedule my day throughout. Uh, we usually like uh, have appointments with different people. We schedule meetings way ahead of time. Since we have like, since we are more organized, we try to like make sure that all the meetings are scheduled well ahead so that we're sure that we have time allotted and we don't like uh, play with other people's time uh, in the sense that if some other uh, work comes in between. So that has been one thing which has helped me like to keep my myself also on track. Uh, yeah, that's, that's specifically when like from work from home, that has been the main tool I'm using. 
Yeah, so I agree with Janani that working from home has been a tough transition, I think, for everyone. Um, Zoe, incredibly envious that you've been doing it for so long and are so well versed at it. Um, but I think when I was in the office, one of the things that really helped me is I have a whiteboard in my room and I like to think about all of my tasks in terms of urgency and importance. So this is nothing new. I know a lot of you know about this, but I actually, um, you know, put blue tape up on my whiteboard, had four different quadrants, and I really started to, you know, with post-its, map out each one of my tasks on the spectrum of urgency and importance. And for each quadrant, you know, the really important urgent tasks were the ones that I needed to complete myself. The ones that were perhaps less important but urgent were the ones that I could delegate. And the ones that were um, less important and less urgent were the ones that I had to plan ahead. Um, or excuse me, were, uh, you know, important but less urgent were the ones that I had to plan ahead. And the ones that were not very important or urgent are the ones that I really tried to evaluate whether or not I needed to complete them. Um, so that was just a little trick that I had used over the years, which really helped me organize and stay focused and, and making sure, I think most importantly, that those tasks that weren't pressing that had to be done today, but that were important, were being considered and were coming into my planning cycles, because I think those are the ones that are easily um, pushed to the bottom of the pile and can slip through the cracks. Thanks, Kay. Planning better. <laughs> I'm going to keep note of that. And Zoe can definitely write a book on working, home, working from home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I do have a follow-up question on that, since a lot of people are interested in, you know, uh, how, how to keep yourself up to date. Uh, so this is much more on a techni technical side. Uh, how do you keep yourself updated with the recent advancements in the field? What are some of the tools and websites or platforms you regularly use to improve your knowledge? Uh, anyone who wanna take up that? Okay, I, I can start the lead on that. Uh, so so uh, in the recent times, what I've seen is that, so, so LinkedIn is definitely like one of the platforms where we can like subscribe to different uses from different companies and they give updates on what is happening in their, in the respective fields. Uh, but apart from that, a lot of virtual conferences happening, especially right now, uh, since mostly the conferences are not very affordable. I myself have felt like it's too costly. I can't go and attend them. But right now with the virtual conference being the uh, trending being the trending factor right now. I think you should all like try to look into that and try to apply for it. It's it's it was very cheap. So recently I, I attended a, a conference on collective intelligence, which is pretty cool. And it's one of the fields which I'm very interested in because it's closely related to storm robotics and trying to like how to gather intelligence from a group of entities, which is very much applicable to our warehouse scenario also. So uh, that has been pretty cool. And it kind of gives you an idea of what people around the world are working on and what research they do. So that's definitely one thing which you can look forward to. And uh, as far as gaining knowledge, like during work, it has always been like, as and when you code and when you get into problems. So, so robot is as very multidisciplinary and we have like so many issues coming from different layers of our uh, software stack at different points of time. So it's mostly like at that point, we usually go in depth into something and try to understand what part we are missing and what we can improve. So it's, it's, mo it's mostly like a continuous improvement process. We, we learn a little by little by what, by the mistakes we make and we keep improving, so. That's true. Thank you, Janani. Um, uh, I have another follow-up question. This is more directed to Deandra. Uh, what, are the, what are the different challenges uh, women in management roles at a tech company would encounter? And what are the possible ways to overcome them? Uh, so one thing I guess that I've encountered myself, and I think this is something that a lot of us as younger professionals may have encountered. When I started as a recent graduate, I was at Becna for about a year before I moved into a leadership role. And I thought it was really difficult as someone who did have less experience to make that jump into a leadership role and you know have a team under me. Um, so I think that that's probably the biggest challenge that I had encountered. And then as my time went on, I've been at Vecna for almost eight and a half years at uh, Vecna Robotics, uh, really helping to build my, my personal credibility, especially since I switched from project management into HR and really making myself an expert more in the HR field, um, getting my SHRM certification and really make sure that I did stay on top of what was going on in that industry so that I could support employees. And over time, I think, you know, help, you know, building this credibility really helped me to just you know, feel more comfortable in my role uh, as I grew as a professional over the last couple of years. Thanks, Yandra. Uh, this definitely helps to the non-technical uh, 
staff who is going to uh, get into robotics. Uh, one thing I forgot to add uh, in the previous question uh, that we uh, at Rebecca Robotics, we have a deep learning club as well. Uh, and uh, me and Janani are a part of it. Uh, even Zoe. So that's a definitely a good uh, way to keep yourself updated. Uh, OK, uh, let's move on. Uh, to the next, to the third question, the capabilities of a robotic systems are largely misinterpreted. How do you manage the client's expectations and streamline the development process to prevent getting derailed from meaningful features? Uh, would love some real life examples here. Uh, Zoe? <laughs> yeah, um, so we have done a lot of like real deployments now. Um, I think one of the things, the keys to this um, that I think Daniel's really good about pushing is the crawl, walk, run philosophy. Um, so like it's not gonna hit the ground day one with every single feature. You know, the important thing is to get kind of a minimal viable product, see how it works in the space, adapt to the space, and then add features and learn over time. Um, and that's a big selling point of our platform is that it's not like we come in, we install it, we leave, that's it forever, um, but that it is adaptive and that we will always be like iterating on your space and figuring out your use case. Um, I think one thing we've struggled with over the years is um, coming up with a generic product um, that we can sell to a lot of people versus going kind of client by client designing these like very customized individual sites for each of them. Um, and I think that's something we're really starting to standardize a lot more now. Um, and, you know, Kay and some of the other project management people we've um, been hiring recently have helped a lot with that. Um, so yeah, and then the other thing I think is just communication and honesty. Um, and especially a lot of clients want these systems in like now, they want them fast. Um, so I think the trade-off of like, well, like you could wait for us, you know, another year for us to build this feature, but then you don't get it for a year um, can be very motivating for people to accept like what we have ready to go right now. Um, Thanks for that perspective, Zoe. Uh, cool, so the next question is, uh, what is the most difficult part of deploying robots to a warehouse? Cool. Uh, so that's something which I can start with. So when I joined Vecna, it was more like a scenario where we didn't have like develop a full fledged set of tools in order to like decide how we want to upload software to the robots, how to connect them to the server there and how to coordinate them. Uh, but over the, over the years, like, uh, like not, uh, sorry, now with two years, it has been an immense development. We have actually come up with a way to like, uh, so suppose we have 50 robots on the field, we can like bring them up in like maybe within 15, 10, 20 minutes. So it has been pretty cool, uh, the development there. And then uh, that's that's one side of it where actually we put the software onto the robots. The other side of it is the robots getting accustomed to the new environment. Because if you see every warehouse has a different set of feature set, it can be the aisles, it can be the racks, it can be so many different things, which can vary from warehouse to warehouse. So adapting the robot to actually uh, get accustomed to its new environment is something which we have been working on and that's something which has to be improved side by side. Um, I think for the deployments I've been involved in, the biggest challenge has just been keeping track of all of the 500 things that are like swirling around that have to get done. Um, there's a lot of site configuration, there's getting the robots brought up and running, um, troubleshooting all the problems that they're having. Um, and then adapting to, like Janani said, every warehouse has something special that we've never seen before. You know, the floor over here is shiny, this like tape is freaking the sensor out. Um, so I think uh, the key to that is A, like hiring people who are good project managers to keep track of all those things. Um, and then just being flexible, um, you know, being really willing to get in on the ground, debug, figure out what's going on, um, and be ready to pivot in the middle of the deployment if you need to. Um, so yeah, I, I think the constant iteration and adaptation um, is one of the hardest parts. Yeah, uh, my perspective of an industrial robotic system definitely has changed a lot since I was since I joined. Uh, so yeah, there's a, a total gap uh, in what we study. Anyway, um, moving on. Uh, there are a lot of robotics companies and technical departments with one or two women in them. Uh, luckily, not with robotics. Uh, have you been in a sim similar situation before? Have you had moments of self-doubts about your skills, uh, working in a male-dominated industry? And how did you overcome them? 
Yeah, so I can take the lead on this. Um, so I've been in multiple industries where I've been the only women, woman in the room. And I think throughout my career, the thing that has helped me the most is to really stay focused on my skills um, and really be confident in the things that I, I know that I'm good at and try to exploit those. I think we all have at one point in our careers struggled with imposter syndrome and it's so easy to fall into that place of self-doubt um, and compare yourself and your skills to the other people in the room. And I think what I would recommend to all the women out there is really understand who you are what you know you're good at and what you can bring to the table and don't be afraid to share that you know don't don't hide that um, if you want to work on other skills on the side that's great but remember to really excel at those things that you have confidence in um, and i think you know when you can start to build momentum and start to build um, you know, some positive track record with that, um, you'll just start to flourish in your career and your confidence will come with that. So that, that would be my advice. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Katie. That was really inspiring. Oh, Zoe, you wanna take a while? Yeah, so I can say, um, you know, Vegna plays a lot of women now, which is really cool. Um, but when I started, I was one of two women in the, on the engineering team for the robotics half of things. Um, so it was kind of, kind of weird sometimes, you know? Um, there was me and Sarah when I started, and then about a year later, Sarah left to go to grad school. Um, and so it was only me for a little bit until we hired Janani, um, who was awesome. Uh, so yeah, there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, for me, I used to like worry a lot about like, am I saying these things right? Like, am I saying these things in a way that like will make people take me seriously or not? And like, eventually I decided that was just like a dumb thing to spend my brain power on basically. Um, because like if I was going to say things that were fact-based, you know, or were coming from experience and evidence, then like people are going to take me seriously or not, and I can't really control that. So like just focus on like doing the things that I'm going to do really, really well, um, and assuming that people are going to be reasonable adults um, that I interact with. Uh, and I feel like that's worked out really well for me. You know, I think all the people I work with here are reasonable adults in that sense. Um, you know, and we've been able to hire, you know, all of these other amazingly talented women, um, you know, and I'm super excited to have Kay here also at a, in a leadership position. I can actually totally relate to that. I still do worry a lot, but I think it will get better. Thank you. Uh, Janani? Yeah, so as Zoe said, so I was an intern at the point when like uh, Zoe was there and then she was actually my mentor and then she had to move to Seattle and then I was like left alone there and I was like, <laughs> okay, uh, now I'm going to handle this and even my mentor is gone. I have a new mentor. Uh, but overall, it has worked out really well for me with Tecna. That's one of the reasons why I really joined back because I feel that everybody like treat everyone with the same respect and equal respect. And uh, one, things which I, one of the things which I follow when I have self-doubt is mostly like I like jot down what are my plus points, uh, what is my passion about, what I really want to achieve in my life. I make sure I, uh, I have a good idea of my goal. So if you have a clear cut goal and a passion, and if you know what you're saying is the right thing at that point of time, you should be like, you're super confident about it, giving your best shot. So that's what I personally follow. That's great. Thanks to Nani. Uh... Okay, moving on. Uh, this is something uh, we as a, a women in robotics group have been like uh, worrying about. So what can employees, managers, and executives do to make the workplace environment better for uh, more women to join the field of robotics? I can start with that one. So, you know, this is something that is certainly critical to, to what I focus on every day, but I think first and foremost, the most important thing that um, executives and managers can do at a company is really create the right culture in an organization to have that inclusive and collaborative environment. So that way, even if you do only have one woman, uh, one woman in engineering that may have those individual self-doubts, it's not a reality that you know people are going to be looking at what she says differently. So I think this is a really strong point for us as an organization where we do genuinely have a great culture of really nice people. Um, so that, that hasn't been an issue for us, even in times where we have had a few women. Um, and I think other things that managers and executives and, and folks can do is to really create opportunities for women 
to connect with women in leadership, um, or even if you don't have women in leadership, to really make sure that you take an interest in you know professionals that are starting out their careers and help them build their confidence and move into new positions in the organization and just really help them you know to to, to get those promotions to to build their own careers. Um, some other things that we do at Beckner Robotics, um, we have. Uh, lunches every once in a while for our female team members. Mm -hmm. uh, we just introduced a professional membership reimbursement. You now we realize that you know there may be things that we just as an organization, you know, aren't able to support at any given moment. So we want to make sure that folks have opportunities, you know, to get support where they want it. Um, so that's another way that we've tried to add, you know, some opportunities for women to connect with women, uh, you know, in engineering fields, but outside of our industry in, in some cases. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. To, you know, to piggyback on that, I would say that uh, it really does start at the top. Um, there, there needs to be a strong executive presence to further all types of di diversity in an organization. And I think we're all very thankful here on this panel to have our leader, Daniel Theobald, who's also the CEO, who's incredibly passionate about, um, you know, every human is equal and that's, you know, gender, um, race, religion, sexual orientation. It doesn't matter if you're a kind person who's passionate and driven to excel in our company, you are absolutely an equal. And um, I think that tone really sets the stage across the board for, you know, not only how we operate um, in terms of our day-to-day -day meetings, but our hiring practices, as Deandra was talking about, our social engagement activities. Um, so, you know, I really think that that's, that's a huge selling point for why I came to the organization personally. Um, and I think that, you know, as leaders throughout different organizations, really to have that mindset of being inclusive uh, is really fundamental to this. One other thing I'll throw in is that creating a balanced workforce really makes all the difference for the women that you do have. Historically, if you have one woman that maybe, you know, maybe they have kids and they're leaving early for childcare, they're going to feel like they're standing out if they're the only one in that situation. But when you have a balanced workforce, and we're lucky that we have such, you know, we see this across all levels of our company, even at our top leadership, everyone's, you know, going to go bring their kids to the doctors or, you know, things like that. So, you know, it really helps when you have that balance in your workforce to make people feel comfortable and to, you know, to make them feel like, yeah, I, I can be in this industry and not feel singled out because they're a woman or something like that. That's true. I'm, I'm really proud of what we are doing right here. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh, moving on to a little bit about your personal life now. Um, how do you how do you manage a full time job uh, with your social life, marriage, or kids? What's your mantra for work life balance? Yeah, so um, as Strini said in, in the intro, so I have four children. Uh, my stepson Ashton is seventeen, and then my little ones. Just the way the birthdays stack up, I actually have a four year old, three year old, and two year old right now. Um, so I've got quite a busy household, um, and I actually think that having kids and being in a leadership role is has really helped me personally because I have to say incredibly structured. Um, all of my time, I, I know what I'm doing with my time. I don't consider myself a person who wastes time just because I don't have time to waste. Um, so even in my free time, I'm constantly being intentional about what I want to do with my time, how I want to spend my time. Um, and I've actually found myself, uh, you know, through the years becoming happier as I've really learned to utilize my time in ways that I know Know are going to bring me fulfillment rather than just you know spending time doing x activity that's just filling a gap i'm not nearly as organized in k <laughs> in my approach uh, i would say that i i have a two about a two and a half year old and a four year old just turned four this past weekend i think i'm more in the stage of trying to get by and survive <laughs> um you know and for those of you out there with kids just know that you know we're, you know, there are all kinds of you know, folks out there. So we're, we're all in this together to, to make you know, our work lives successful and our personal lives. Um, you know, I, I try to get as much of my work done, you know, during the core work day as I can. Um, I would say I'm always checking my email first thing when I wake up and still in bed before the kids wake up uh, to make sure that I can at least get a, a head start on what's coming down the pipeline in my day. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Yeah, and I should probably add too that having a nanny is definitely one of the most critical pieces to being successful at your job or having a very reliable childcare situation. Um, in my case, a nanny, but I wouldn't be able to do it without that help. That is very true. We used to have our, our kids in a daycare and that was actually the most stressful part of, of our day because our daycare was really far away from the office. So it would take me about an hour to get to our daycare and I had to get there by uh, five o'clock at one of them, 5.30 at the other. And at rush hour, that's a tough one. So during COVID, my mother-in-law actually took over as our full-time care provider. So she lives with us Monday through Friday, sometimes on the weekends. Um, and like Kay said, having someone that does come, game changer. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I can't imagine how you guys do it. Uh, just this job and managing this group and I'm done. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, I like this one. Uh, what advice uh, would you give your 10 years younger self? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'll take a crack at this. Um, so somebody actually gave me this advice when I was early in my career, and I think it was just invaluable. They said to me, um, take advantage of every opportunity and don't be afraid to fail. Um, so I think as I look back in my career and my tenure younger self, I think that advice still holds true that when you're early in your career, it's really the time to play in the sandbox. The tasks you're getting, the challenges you're facing are going to be at a smaller scale with less risk and less implications if you do fail. Um, and those are the times to really experiment, to try new things, to, um, you know, as Sandra did, to try a new role, test out if you want to be in HR versus project management versus mechanical engineering, um, don't be afraid to take some classes at night after work um, and definitely say yes to every opportunity that sounds interesting to you because that's really how you get to, to know more people in the organization. It's how you get to um, learn new skills. And I think, you know, from my experience personally, unlike all these women on the panel, I don't have a degree in X. I don't have the thing to hang my hat on. I think you know, what's really made me well-rounded in my career is the fact that I have done a lot of different things and I have the ability to flex into a new industry. I, I don't have a background in robotics, um, but I was able to flex in this industry and really add value on day one because I've been part of large organizations where I know how structured, rigorous, regulated processes are orchestrated. Small, nimble consulting firms where I know what it's like to do business development and get the next client. And really just having all that breadth of experience has really been personally helpful in my career. Thank you, Gay. That's a lot of food for thought. <laughs> um, uh, moving on, uh, this is something a lot of people have been asking me. Um, what advice uh, would you give to recent robotics graduate and young enthusiast of the field? Uh, again, uh, this is very common, yeah, that how can someone from other technical and non-technical disciplines can get into robotics? Yeah, I can start uh, on this one. So um, one of the biggest plus points of me doing a, a robotics degree, at least like uh, in the US, is the exposure to technology, like the practical field of technology rather than theory alone. Uh, that is what has like helped me to understand deeper into a subject and actually experience what it is to make a product and give a product to somebody else, like a customer. So uh, there's a lot of difference between uh, doing a research project at school versus actually delivering a product to a customer. The quality, the, the amount of the way you code, the the things you should consider, not just on that small uh, set of code you write, but how it impacts or interacts with other systems, how the whole system workflow works, and whether is your code secure, is your code, uh, how, how does it work when you have like, when you move from one robot to like 50 robots. So you have to consider so many uh, phases and like, like scalability, reliability, robustness of the system. So it's like a system level, uh, you need to think big, basically not just on your project, so one thing which you can try to like learn when you are trying, uh, when you are still a graduate and in your school is mostly to like refine your skills on code development. That's one thing which can definitely help you moving forward. Another thing is actually doing practical projects. So you actually play with and experiment with real robots or 
whatever software you have. So try to put it on something which is more than just a practical sim like, or a small simulator in your computer. That's going to gain you like much more knowledge into how a real world object works. So that's definitely going to help you. Like if you are already in the robotics field, like trying more projects on it and developing. Also, like one more important thing is like robotics is a multidisciplinary field. There's so many things you can do uh, if you are a robotics engineer. You can like you might have an interest in computer vision, motion like motion planning. It can be navigation. It can be so many different things. So, finding out your passion in one of them or like at least one or two of them is going to help you like propel forward in what you really want to do as a robotics software engineer. Um, but if you're not into robotics and you're totally from a non-technical field, I think the first step would be like to find like, so Udacity and so many other courses, like there are fields right now, like Coursera, Udacity, edX. So, so many sites are available for you, which gives you a good amount of introduction into what robotics is. And uh, it also like, so, so it need not be that you have to be a, a excelled in coding to in order to come into robotics field. It can be that you have some set of specific set of knowledge which can actually be used or applied in the field of robotics. So just for you to identify what part of your interest or knowledge can be used actually in the field of robotics and you start pursuing or developing skill set in that way. So that's what I think is like pretty important, like going deep diving. And personally, I have been uh, taking up a lot of hobby projects, which I really enjoy because it actually, I can do it and like use it in my home and it gives me a lot of satisfaction. So uh, I believe in practicality, like developing practical stuff more than theory specifically. So I always experiment with things, with small, small things at home, like developing lights, which listen to music and then have disco sounds and all that. So <laughs> that's been my fun hobby throughout, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Janani. Um, just to add on to that, I would say, you know, as somebody who's non-technical and entering the field of robotics, you know, as Janani said, really focus on, you know, what it is that you're you're already good at. And if you need to add courses or well, you know, to get a more well-rounded background through uh, you know, going to lectures, doing courses, talking to people, you know, that's also a great way to um to expand your skill set, but I think at the core, if you know what you're good at, um, try to market yourself that way. So if you're in aerospace and you've already done a ton of simulation work, you know, highlight a, that in your resume. And more importantly, if you know that you want to be at a specific company, make sure you network into that company. Um, you know, Deandra can attest to this, but she probably has about 10 to 15 seconds to review every resume. And you really want to jump off that page. And one of the best ways to do that is to network yourself into a role. Um, I think a referral, you know, is going to be um, it's going to be a lot easier for you to transition and to pivot your career if you are referred and somebody says, hey, I know they're not in robotics now, but they're a great person. They definitely have what it takes to be successful in this field and they have a lot of relative and relevant experience in this other area. I think we should consider them. Um, you know, that's, that's a great way to, to try to pivot in your career. I'm going to put my recruiting hat on for a second, uh, since Kay happened to mention reading resumes, but something that I have noticed when looking at a lot of new graduate resumes, even meeting them at career fairs, is that um, you know, sometimes people are in different industries, or even sometimes being in robotics, but being in a robotics program that tries to be broad and teach you a little bit of everything, I actually find that to be very difficult to hire because you know so much of everything but you're not specific in any one thing. So one other item that I might recommend is while it's great to be broad and make sure that you have a little bit of everything, make sure that you do have an area of, of expertise and specialty that you can really call out on your resume because you know we, we do need to sometimes see that people have enough of a foundation in what's specific to what we do to be able to move forward in the process. Yeah. Um, and we're hiring. So, <laughs> and so take a look. Okay. Uh, wow, these were a lot of points. So summarize that uh, application-based approach, uh, building up on your skill set, and being at least an expert in one thing. That's about it. Okay. I hope it helps uh, people who are looking for this advice. Thank you. Um, moving on, uh, with so many talented recent graduates, uh, what kind of traits are you looking uh, for in a candidate to be a perfect fit for our company? Yeah, again. <laughs> sure. Um, so something that's 
really important is being very explicit about your technical skills. Um, you know, talk about practical projects as much as possible. Those are things that really stand out. So as Janani mentioned, that experience with real robots is very different than you know, your theoretical experience. And while that's also great, that's something that will absolutely make you stand out. Um, and actually to further, to clarify what I was saying before about being an expert in one field, not necessarily, you know, a really targeted expert, but you know, the broadness that I see are folks who take a program where they're doing electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and computer science and like everything. Um, so, you know, maybe pick one of those and specialize a little bit while still being broad. Um, yeah, thanks, Deandra. I think, um, you know, to kind of pivot a little bit, since I'm non-technical, what I really like to focus on when I'm looking for candidates and in interviewing is the personality characteristics. I mean, I, I share Daniel Theobald, our, our CEO, I share his thoughts that you can, you can train and teach an intelligent person to do a lot of different things if they have the right personality. And so I look for that personality. I look for somebody who has incredible drive, who has passion, who wants to do projects on the weekends, who like Janani is, um, you know, inventing cool light schemes and disco parties. And, and it's something that she does in her free time because it's fun. You know, those are the type of people who are going to be long-term successful employees if they have the passion um, and they want to genuinely be part of the organization and want, and, and work isn't a chore. Work is something that you do when you get to go further develop the thing that you want to do in your free time. Um, you know, so the passion, the drive, and um, really somebody who is curious and is not afraid to, um, you know, get their feet wet and kind of put themselves in situations that, um, you know, may be uncomfortable for them and can handle and navigate those with grace. Um, you know, those are the types of things I'll, I'll kind of put people maybe on edge with different questions and in interviews. If, and if they're able to kind of navigate that and really, um, you know, show me that, uh, you know, they're not, their feathers aren't ruffled by kind of having a curveball thrown at them. Um, you know, that's the type of person, because that's what we deal with on a daily basis. You know, this is not a happy path industry. Robotics is tough. It's challenging. It's new. It's innovative. It's, um, you know, as Zoe said, we didn't anticipate that there was going to be a shiny reflector on the wall or the floor was going to be wet or, you know, all these different things. And, um, you know, somebody who's not afraid to face those challenges head on and also is able to do it uh, in a way that's calm under pressure. I think those are personally the skills that I look for in an interview. Um, and I'll say that holds true on the technical side also. Um, you know, we do have a certain bar of experience we expect, but beyond that, we're looking much more at potential and at, um, yeah, like uh, personality, interpersonal skills, attitude, um, more than like depth of experience with any specific technology. Um, so we talk a lot about independence, um, about the ability to go out on your own and learn about something, um, dive into debugging problems on your own without needing um, too much guidance. Um, and then also, yeah, kind of drive and ownership um, and taking something and pushing it forward um, and having that kind of independence. Um, and then also can context and decision making. Um, so the ability to look at the big picture, weigh a lot of different things, um, keep the client and the use case in mind and like make decisions in that context. Um, and even think beyond like specifically what you were told to do, um, to, you know, be aware like is this actually the right way to approach this problem? Is this the best solution? Um, so kind of asking that question. Um, and then obviously, you know, having a positive, calm, um, upbeat attitude about things and like working well with other people, um, even if it gets a little bit stressful. Um, and I'll say besides that, um, for like actual technical skills, um, so I'm on the enterprise team. Um, and so we do a lot of stuff about the server that runs the robots, um, communicating with the robots, these tools that we have for supporting the robots and doing the site config. Um, so right now, the people we're looking to hire um, are people with web development and enterprise software experience. Um, and so we're not even selecting right now for people who have experience with robots in particular. We're actually just looking for this kind of broader skill set to bring in some of that expertise um, and apply it to like what we're doing right now. Um, so yeah, enthusiasm, um, independence, um, 
not necessarily like it's not all going to be about like coding the arm to like grab the thing you know there's a lot of things that we can bring into this field right now um, and i want to see a ton of resumes come out of this event um, and i'm normally not a big linkedin person but if you want to connect with me on linkedin um, and talk about anything else or the industry feel free to yeah, I think that holds true for all of our panelists. Feel free to connect with any of us. We're, we're happy to uh, continue the conversation offline. Uh, yeah, I think all, most of the, all, most all the points are covered by Deandra, Kay, and Zoe. Uh, but one thing when I joined, what I can say personally is that uh, you're going to meet challenges much more like totally in a different scale than what you were used to in your like grad school and stuff. So you should have an attitude like, be ready to just knock down any challenge which come in your way. That's that's kind of the attitude we're looking for because it's going to be, this is your age to like work hard and then like, you know, experience how difficult things are and like really, like when you work on a project which is going to be impacting so many lives and actually going to make a difference to the world, you should definitely like have that passion to like dive deep into it and be ready to solve those problems. Never give up. <laughs> Even if something doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you so much, guys. Uh, one more question for the night. Um, what are the effects of the recent pandemic on the robotics industry? And a lot of people have been wondering about that. Um, is it getting positively affected as the social distancing prevails? Uh, should we expect more jobs uh, now or in the near future? What do you guys think? Um, yeah, so definitely, obviously, yes. Um, I think this is going to be a big moment for the robotics industry. Um, and I think if you look at like, I think the pandemic is going to be a catalyst for something that has already been going on, which is if you look at the last few years, I think the technology is finally maturing and it's meeting up with the market interest um, in a new way. Um, and like having been at Vecna in particular since 2015, in 2015 we were selling like one QC bot to one hospital and that would be like our sale for the year. Um, and so to watch it go from that to the place we are just a few years later now, we were selling dozens, um, potentially hundreds within the next few years of these robots to these huge names um, in logistics and in warehousing. Um, it's, it's really exploding. Um, and I think the social distancing, both the like practical elements of it and the kind of like psychosocial elements um, are gonna get people like even more going into this. Um, and so that kind of leads me to something else that I wanted to say about like the skills that is gonna we're gonna look into um, is that as this happens um, and all of these companies start looking to scale up and start looking to build out um, deploy to more clients deploy a more reliable infrastructure um, there's this wider range of skills that are going to be really in demand in the robotics industry and so I really think that a lot of the things that we're looking for right now you know we're looking for people with DevOps background to deploy all this code to all these different robots. We're looking for people with IT background, looking for people with web development background to build these applications to support robots to you know, deploy quickly and efficiently to keep our clients in the loop with the analytics and the dashboard. Um, so these are a ton of skills that aren't traditionally like robots. You know, you're not writing the path planning code. You're not writing the like arm control code. Um, but all of these are gonna be huge opportunities within the industry as a whole. Um, so if any of that sounds like you, um, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunities opening up at the intersection of all of those disciplines. Thank you, Zoe. We're definitely booming <laughs> as an industry. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for your perspective on so many different topics. And uh, I guess we still have a couple of minutes to take uh, questions from the audience. So Sanjuk, shall I hand over to you for the top popular questions? So I have a few here. Uh, the most upvoted question is, uh, I think Janani already covered a part of it, but I'll still ask it again if anyone has new views. Uh, can you suggest uh, some projects in robotics that can be done, done as hobby? Okay, I can start with it. Uh, so it all depends on your passion. Uh, my passion is like uh, household robots is my passion. So that's how I came up with the word about, uh, which I have like, like Dharni spoke about. It's basically a home helper robot, which does uh, carry stuff from one room to the other. I'm working on word about 2.0 right now. But uh, anyway, so, um, so it depends on what you want to specialize on. There are a lot of things out there which are 
expensive to be considered as a hobby project. So for example, if I want to really make a robot which has to move stuff from one place to other, it's like I have to bring up parts which can actually like do assembly, develop a robotic arm. So it depends on how much you want to invest in it, but always a practical hobby project is going to give you a learning experience and a sense of, sense of satisfaction, which is like, which you can never get any other place. So that's something been, which has been driving me. Uh, but there are still a lot of courses out there which give you, um, so, so it need not be actually something which is hard uh, hardware specific. It can be something which you can do on a cloud server. For example, now AWS has come up, which is giving you a lot of opportunity with GPU RAM. Uh, even our deep learning course, we are like trying to experiment with a lot of uh, cloud-based GPU systems where we can run different codes of like different intensities, which require very heavy resources, which may not be supported by a computer. So the best thing to start with is like, if you want to work with uh, ROS and stuff like that, try to get that installed in your computer, mostly ROS and uh, Gazebo. Gazebo is like optional. You can still use RVIS to understand how things work. So if you want to start with robotics in a base way, start with ROS projects, which includes simple motion planning, computer vision specific projects, which can help you like understand what are the different components of a very simple basic robot and how to play with different features of that robot. I do have a little thing to add here. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, it's it's all about like staying curious about how things work. Just keep asking yourself questions and keep looking for something that you can actually solve. Uh, it may be as simple as just controlling your uh, room light with with a clap or you know something like that, which which you know means something and uh, can help you or people around you. Like Jenny made a uh, elderly uh, following robot. That one example of that. Uh, thank you, Dhairi. Thank you, Jirani. Uh, I think we have just one more uh, top up worded question saying, what steps do you take to troubleshoot when your robot breaks? Uh. <laughs> I can talk about this a little bit. Um, I think that our system is a little bit unique and that we have um, stuff on the robot and then the robots are talking to the server and there's all these robots. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, the first thing that I always look to do is try to isolate where the problem is occurring. Um, so if there's any kind of communication, like as much as you can check both ends of this and find like, is it broken on the client side? Is it broken on the server side? Um, so kind of like a, a binary search, like divide, um, figure out where it's coming from. Um, other than that, depending on like what piece and what technology it's using, there might be different debugging options. Um, so like within ROS and C++, you know, sometimes we would use GDB, sometimes we would just, you know, go in and add debug logging um, to rerun something. Um, you know, in Java, there's a way you can connect a debugger to the JVM that's different. Um, so a lot of it gets kind of domain specific, um, but understanding the debugging options and being able to apply them. Um, and then it's a lot of just like, Persistence, I think, is a big key with debugging and troubleshooting. You know, you're going to find one thing and it's not going to make sense. And so you have to look at another thing and figure out what you expect that to be and what it's, um, what it's doing instead. Um, I think being clear on your expectations is also really important. Um, and starting from a place of understanding like what it should be doing and what it should look like at all parts of the pipeline. Um, that lets you identify more clearly like how what is actually happening is different from what should be happening. Um, if all else fails, uh, turn it off and on again. Um, Recheck out the code and compile it again. I don't know. Stuff like that is a classic because it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I so guess everyone has their own different uh, ways to debug, right? <laughs> That's true. So one of the things which I follow is like, as Zoe said, first is isolating the problem, figuring out where the problem is exactly located. And usually we have logging, which kind of gives us information on what is happening, what would have failed. And so, so since we have many different components, it's like, like from the log statements, find of figuring out which component to look into to figure out where exactly the problem is. So we have like a component level and a process level. We can look through, we can, I, have, I give a checklist mostly and I kind of pick up, okay, check this, I check this, I check this. And if none of those are there, then it might be something new. So then I have to create a new checklist saying, okay, this a new one has come, so let's add this to the checklist. So that's kind of the format which, yeah, I use for uh, debugging, but it's, it's actually, I find debugging a very, very interesting uh, scenario. It's, it's something which you can, you learn a lot more about the system than you already know. And it also opens up scenarios of improvement for your entire current software. So 
yeah. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, know when to get a second pair of eyes on the problem. Um, you know, it's good to be independent and to look into something on your own, but if you spent, you know, half an hour or an hour on it and you're not getting anywhere and you're stuck, um, definitely asking for help or just asking a peer to come in and like, um, I don't know, it's almost like the rubber duck debugging people talk about, you know, sometimes even just talking through the problem to another person can help you see things differently. That's really true. I, I do that all the time and it works. <laughs> so, uh, I, so, so we are a little uh, over time. Uh, uh, so uh, can the panelists wait for a little bit more or we should and we can even end right here. Uh, also, do we have any more questions? <laughs> I can um, uh, uh, we do have a couple more, actually, not much. So I okay. think we can. I um, guess we can take two more if everyone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's. Cool. So these are kind of related questions, I guess. So the first is, what is the scope for a hardware engineer to get into a robotics startup, since most of the positions are like software based? We build all, all of our robots, <laughs> if that gives you any indication. So there are endless opportunities. We do have an in-house team of mechanical, electrical, and firmware engineers, plus our manufacturing team that build all of our robots. So keep an eye on our website. Uh, we do have openings that pop up periodically um, as we grow those teams. Um, but we, we have lots of opportunities for hardware engineers as well. Um, I guess then the last question for the day is, uh, what programming language skills do you look for? Is C++ preferred over Python or anything otherwise? Um, so I can jump in. This is kind of what I was talking about with web development before. Um, so right now we have three software teams. Um, there's Enterprise. Um, so on Enterprise, we're looking for web development, which means we're looking for Java and JavaScript um, primarily. And specifically, the JavaScript framework we use is kind of an old one called Backbone. Um, in the other two teams, um, we have fleet autonomy, um, which manages like multi-robot coordination, and then we have robot autonomy. And so on fleet autonomy, that's also primarily Java based. Um, and then for the robot autonomy team in particular, um, they're the ones dealing with ROS. Um, and so that's C++. Um, more of our code is written in C++ than Python, but both of those are, you know, reasonable. Um, and then secondarily, they also do a little bit of Java. Um, but again, you know, we're kind of looking for basic competence in those things. And what really takes people above and beyond is showing that they have done something really interesting with those skills um, and have the, the drive to, to really see projects through. So I guess those sum up most of our questions for the night. Great. Uh, thank you, Sanjuk Shah, for handling that. And Thank you, Kay, Deandra, Janani, Zoe. Uh, I'm glad we could do something like this. And I loved knowing more about your lives. Uh, it was really inspiring. I hope we are able to uh, continue this work and to enable and promote more women, more women in robotics. Uh, thank you so much, guys. All right, um, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for spearheading this whole thing. Um, and I know you and Kay spent a lot of time um, figuring out the technology for this right now. Um, so to recognize that investment. <laughs> Thank you. It was really Thank lovely to be so able to much. speak with all of you women tonight. Um, and I hope everyone on the line has a lovely evening and we will hopefully connect on LinkedIn. Thanks guys. Thanks for yeah. the opportunity. Resumes. Thank you. We are going to post all the links for all the participants. So uh, we'll send you an email something. So just keep in touch and we expect everyone to see you in our future events. All right. Thank you, everyone. So Have a good night, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank Bye. you. Um, I'm just gonna drop off then, right? Yeah.